R. E. Lee, A Biography, Volume 4, Chapters 26 through 28. Written by Douglas Southall Freeman. Published by Charles Scribner's Sons, New York and London, 1934. Digitalization by Bill Thayer. Audiobook produced by Open Audio Recordings and read by Nancy, a Microsoft Azure AI Neural Voice. Chapter 26, Farewell to Northern Virginia. On his return to Lexington, General Lee found that instruction at the college had progressed without particular incident during his absence. The trustees had met on April 19, as they had a reason for wishing to be in session when he was not present. They had at that time approved the action of the faculty in urging Lee to take a rest, had recommended that his leave be extended until the end of the session, at least, and had designated Professor White to act as the president's confidential secretary and aide in case Lee returned before commencement. This had accorded with an earlier resolution of the faculty that had contemplated a plan for relieving the general of part of his work. The trustees had gone much farther than this, in order that the president's mind be relieved of any concern for the support and comfort of his family, they determined to convey to Mrs. Lee the use of the president's house for life, and to pay her an annuity of $3,000 a year in case the general died or suffered disability. This was done, the board insisted, because part of the gifts for the president's house had been made to provide for Mrs. Lee, and also because much of the new endowment of the college had been donated as a tribute to General Lee. The whole resolution had been conceived in the friendliest spirit and was in keeping with the consideration shown General Lee during the whole of his administration by the appreciative trustees. It was consonant, also, with the facts attending many of the donations to the college. General Ewell, for example, had given $500 for the endowment on condition that the interest go to Lee's salary, and admirers at the White Sulphur one summer had proposed to raise $50,000 to be used by the college for his benefit during his life and to revert to his family at his death. In both instances, Lee had urged that the money be dedicated to permanent endowment and he would not now consent to the proposal of the trustees. On the very day he got home he wrote his acknowledgments to the board and said, though fully sensible of the kindness of the board, and justly appreciating the manner in which they sought to administer to my relief, I am unwilling that my family should become a tax to the college, but desire that all its funds should be devoted to the purposes of education. I know that my wishes on this subject are equally shared by my wife, and I therefore request that the provisions of the fourth and fifth resolutions, covering the conveyance of the house and the annuity, may not be carried into effect. I feel full assurance that, in case a competency should not be left to my wife, her children would not suffer her to want. Despite the general's wishes, the board quietly had the life-term lease recorded and adhered to its resolution regarding the annuity. The election of Custis Lee as head of the college in succession to his father carried with it the occupancy of the president's house and thereby removed Mrs. Lee's objections to the continued use of that property after the death of the general. Mrs. Lee steadfastly declined, however, to accept the annuity. Scarcely had the general settled himself at home than Valentine made his promised visit to model the bust. Lee showed him the family pictures and offered him one of the first-floor rooms of his residence as a temporary studio, but the sculptor preferred not to disturb the family and after much searching found a vacant store under the hotel that he could utilize. There, on a low platform, Lee sat for Valentine, with the understanding that nobody but Custis or Professor White was to be admitted. Lee was not comfortable during this ordeal. Often, unconsciously, he would put his hand to his heart, as if in pain, but he made no complaint. The nearest he came to it was when he asked if Custis might not come and sit in his stead, as there was said to be a resemblance between them. Veteran and artist talked of many things, of the days of Lee's boyhood, of his swims in the Potomac, of his years at West Point, of his experience in the Mexican War, and of the themes of the day. Once Lee asked Valentine if he knew a certain sculptress, whose name he did not recall with precision. When Valentine identified her, Lee said, Oh, that is the name. Well, the lady wrote me a very polite letter in which she asked if I would give her sittings for a bust, at the same time enclosing photographs of some of her works which were not too profusely draped. In her letter she also asked when she could come to make the bust, and a friend, who had been looking at the pictures, suggested July or August, as the most of her work seemed to have been done in the summertime. Valentine had jokes of his own.
He much wanted a pair of the general's boots for a statue he intended to design, and he very adroitly asked for them in this wise. An office seeker, he said, besought Andrew Jackson to make him minister to England, and when told that post was filled, asked if he might not be secretary of legation. Advised that no vacancy was in prospect there, he appealed to be made vice consul. Jackson gave the same answer. Well, then, Mr. President, said the ambitious seeker after fame, would you give me a pair of old boots? Valentine added, that is what I would like to have you do for me, General. I think there is a pair at the house that you can have, Lee answered, after he had smiled at Valentine's jest and at his finesse. The next day General Lee delivered them in person, a pair of dress boots, size 41-2C, that bore on the lining the words, R. E. Lee, U.S.A. One day during the course of Valentine's work, the sitter heard a noise in the room. Looking up, he saw a student of the college who had learned that the general was sitting for a bust and had determined, boy-like, to see what it was all about. General Lee showed no impatience at this intrusion. How would you like to be in my place, Mr. Carlton? he inquired. The student, much abashed, made a speedy exit. At last the modeling was done, and as Mrs. Lee could not come to look at the bust it was carried to her home in order that she might criticize it and, if she liked it, give it the approval without which she would permit neither a portrait of the general, a photograph, nor a work of plastic art to go forth officially. A bad fifteen minutes for her husband followed. Several of Mrs. Lee's friends had gathered to serve as her advisors. Valentine turned the bust repeatedly so as to afford the best views, and at the direction of his wife the general moved likewise and stood now in profile, now with full face towards them. It was an ordeal as bad as battle, but it brought no protest from his lips. Was it not the first duty of an old soldier to obey the orders of superior authority? One more visit and Valentine was gone. On his call to say goodbye, he found Lee chatting in the parlor. I feel that I have an incurable disease coming on, old age, Valentine heard him say. I would like to go to some quiet place in the country and rest. But there was little time for rest. The date for the college commencement was approaching. Final examinations kept the president for long hours. Then followed the formal exercises and the meeting of the trustees, a rather important meeting, at that. Lee reported at length on the work of the year. Only one student had been dismissed, two had been suspended, and three had been withdrawn by parents at the request of the faculty. Religiously the life of the college had been active. The YMCA had erected a Sunday school building near House Mountain and had organized a like school near Thornhill. Fifty students were teaching classes on the Sabbath. One hundred and twenty-nine were church members, and nineteen of these had joined during the session. The advancement of the students was noticeable. Their knowledge was declared to be larger and more precise. Classes had been divided into sections of convenient size. The School of English Language and Literature had been organized and its work apportioned among three professors of other departments. Instruction in the School of Applied Chemistry also had been given but required a regular professor. Plans for the future included the closing of the preparatory department, which was no longer necessary, the reorganization of the business school, and the adoption of definite curricula for the schools of agriculture and commerce. The trustees approved most of these recommendations and, in addition, provided that the law department should become one of the regular schools of the college, with Judge Brockenbrough at its head. It was at this time that John Randolph Tucker was elected second professor. A junior law course was authorized, with the proviso that if a student followed only this course of law, he would be required to take work in one of the other departments of the college. Temporary instruction was arranged for the schools that did not have full professors, and an adjunct professor of ancient languages was named in the person of a Confederate veteran and recent graduate of the college, Milton W. Humphreys. No large gifts to the college were reported, but there were whispers that a great astronomical observatory was to be erected in Virginia and that it might be procured for Washington College. Finally, the trustees repeated their resolutions regarding provision for Mrs. Lee and urged the general to take all possible measures for the protection of his health, even if this involved travel in the United States or abroad. Professor White was continued as confidential secretary and aide to the president. The commencement itself was brilliant. Twenty-eight degrees were conferred.
Rev. W. T. Brentley of Atlanta, Georgia, a minister of much distinction, delivered the baccalaureate sermon, and Hugh Blair Grigsby told of the achievements of the trustees' Liberty Hall Academy. Lee must have been heartily tired of doctor's examinations by this time, for he had been thumped and quizzed in Richmond, in Savannah, and in Richmond again, to say nothing of his consultation with Dr. Selden in Norfolk and his regular sieges at the hands of Drs. Barton and Madison in Lexington. But adherence to professional advice was part of his creed of obedience to constituted authority, and he yielded now to a new request that he go to Baltimore and consult Dr. Thomas Hepburn Buckler, a physician of high standing who had gone to Paris after the war between the states and had come back to the United States on a visit. On June 30, 1870, just a week after the trustees adjourned, General Lee set out for Baltimore alone. He went by canal boat to Lynchburg and thence, by rail past Orange and Culpeper, scene of many a week's encampment, to his own city of Alexandria. We arrived at Alexandria at 5 p.m., July 1st, he duly chronicled for Mrs. Lee, and were taken to Washington and kept in the cars till 7.45, when we were sent on. It was the hottest day I ever experienced, or I was in the hottest position I ever occupied, both on board the packet and in the railroad cars, or I was less able to stand it, for I never recollect having suffered so much. He was met at the train by Mr. and Mrs. Taggart and was driven to their home. So exhausted was he by the journey that he stayed Abed the next morning until eight o'clock, something almost without precedent. It was a rainy day and it brought confinement to house and a two-hour physical examination at the hands of Dr. Buckler, who was more encouraging than some of the other physicians had been. He says he finds my lungs working well, the action of the heart a little too much diffused, but nothing to injure. He is inclined to think my whole difficulty arises from rheumatic excitement, both the first attack in front of Fredericksburg and the second last winter. Says I appear to have a rheumatic constitution, must guard against cold, keep out in the air, exercise, etc., as the other physicians prescribe. In the meantime, he has told me to try lemon juice and watch the effect. Neither the weather, the heat, nor the doctor's examination quite daunted the general. In the very letter in which he recounted all this, he teased Mrs. Lee for her familiar tardiness by holding high the example of Mrs. Taggart, who had come with Mr. Taggart to the station more than an hour before the arrival of the train bearing Lee. His host, the general admiringly avowed, had a punctual wife, who regulates everything for him, so that he had plenty of time for reflection. Nor did his physical condition dim Lee's love of the pleasant company of his kin. He paid a visit, probably on July 4, to Washington Peter, and after a second examination by Dr. Buckler he went for a leisured stay at Goodwood, near Ellicott City, the home of his cousin, Charles Henry Carter. In that friendly atmosphere he remained considerably more than a week. Then, on July 14, he crossed the Potomac for the last time, southward bound. Perhaps he gazed at the pillars of Arlington, gleaming in the sunlight, as he had seen them so often when he had ridden home from Washington. But if they moved his heart, he said nothing of it to Mrs. Lee. He wrote, instead, that he had caught cold and that he found it piping hot at the mansion house in Alexandria, where he put up for the night. On the 15th he had a conference with his old attorney, Francis L. Smith, about the possible recovery of Arlington, but he got little encouragement. At the instance of Mr. Smith, Lee removed from the hotel to the lawyer's residence, where many of his friends came to pay their respects, in the good old phrase of the times. Among them was Colonel John S. Mosby. Lee talked with him and, as they were about to part, said to him, Colonel, I hope we shall have no more wars. That afternoon, if his plans worked out according to his schedule, he went to Cassius Lee's home, which was his headquarters for a round of visits, parting calls in the most somber sense, to old friends in the neighborhood of Arlington. In the company of Cassius Lee, whom he had known all his life in closest intimacy, the general felt none of the restraint he usually displayed in talking about the past. Together, with no audience except Cassius Lee's silently attentive sons, they ranged the years. When they came to the dark era of blood, Cassius Lee questioned and the general explained. They talked of Jackson, and Lee told how the failure of Stonewall to get on McClellan's flank had forced him to fight the Battle of Mechanicsville, lest the Federals on the other side of the Chickahominy sweep into Richmond. But he must have had ample praise for Jackson, for he expressed the belief that if his great lieutenant had been with him at Gettysburg that battle would have been a Confederate victory. Jackson, said he, would have held the heights which Ewell took on the first day.
Ewell he accounted a good officer, but one who would never exceed his orders. Directed to go to Gettysburg, Ewell would not occupy a position beyond the town. Cassius Lee asked him why he had not moved on Washington after the Second Battle of Manassas. The general answered, because my men had nothing to eat. I could not tell my men to take that fort, pointing to the nearby ramparts of Fort Wade, when they had nothing to eat three days. I went to Maryland to feed my army. That led him to describe the mismanagement of the Confederate commissary. The Southern press came in for stern criticism. Patriotism, the general said, seemed to have no weight with the newspapers. They would print troop movements regardless of the effect on the plans of the army. Lee explained to his cousin that when Longstreet was sent south in the summer of 1863 every effort was made to keep the facts from the enemy, but the papers told all about it. Who was the ablest federal general he had opposed? He did not hesitate a moment for the answer. McClellan, by all odds, he said emphatically. This was the fullest conversation on military matters that General Lee ever had after the war and is the only one of which a measurably adequate record exists. The talk with Wade Hampton was brief and, it will be remembered, was but partially reported. Lee's reticence in discussing the war was always noticeable and extended to his correspondence. Concerning the incidents of his resignation in 1861, he seems to have written only two letters, the familiar one to Reverdy Johnson and another to Sidney Herbert, in which he denied the oft-repeated story that he remained on the staff of General Scott to the last possible hour in order that he might discover the military secrets of the federal government. So far as is known, he wrote only two general letters on his campaigns. The more lengthy of the two was an answer to some inquiries from W. M. MacDonald, who was writing a school history. In this letter, dated April 15, 1868, Lee explained why he went into Maryland in 1862 and why he chose to stand on the hills behind Fredericksburg rather than to dispute Burnside's crossing. In describing the strategy of these operations, he wrote with the same clear and direct logic displayed in so many of his letters to President Davis. As to the Battle of Gettysburg, he went on, I must again refer you to my official acts. Its loss was occasioned by a combination of circumstances. It was commenced in the absence of correct intelligence. It was continued in the effort to overcome the difficulties by which we were surrounded, and it would have been gained could one determined and united blow have been delivered by our whole line. As it was, victory trembled in the balance for three days, and the battle resulted in the infliction of as great amount of injury as was received, and in frustrating federal plans for the season. Lee used somewhat the same language, though he was more reserved, in replying to questions from B. H. Wright of Rome, N. Y., a West Pointer and an engineer. The failure of the Confederate Army at Gettysburg, Lee told Wright, was owing to a combination of circumstances, but from which success might have been reasonably expected. In the remainder of this letter, Lee answered queries from Wright regarding Burnside's movements to Fredericksburg and the feasibility, after the campaign of 1862, of an alternative plan of federal operations devised by Wright. As regards General McClellan, said Lee, I have always entertained a high opinion of his capacity and have no reason to think that he omitted to do anything that was in his power. This letter to Wright was so cautiously written that publication would have done no harm. The answers to MacDonald concluded with the request, I must ask that you will consider what I have said as intended solely for yourself. Comment on particular campaigns was rare. Lee twice gave his estimate of the strength of his army at the Wilderness Spotsylvania campaign. He confirmed as substantially correct a narrative of Lee to the rear, and he wrote Dr. A. T. Bledsoe the well-known letter regarding responsibility for Jackson's movement at Chancellorsville, a letter that exhibits alike his candor and his respect for the fame of his dead lieutenant. Beyond this, he held to the silence he imposed upon himself when he returned home from Appomattox. Perhaps in those two days with Cassius Lee, in the summer of 1870, he talked more of his battles than in all the rest of his postbellum career and it was with less heaviness of heart. Five days were spent in the pleasant company of Alexandria friends, then on the morning of July 19 the general went to Ravensworth. The weather continued uncomfortably hot. Coupled with his pain, it kept him close to the house and compelled him to forego anticipated visits to his sons and to his sister-in-law, the widow of Sidney Smith Lee.
he remained at Ravensworth until July 25 and then returned home. Despite the heat, his trip of nearly four weeks had done him temporary good. He had moved slowly, had rested much, had avoided all crowds, and had enjoyed the fellowship of his own kin, fellowship always precious to him. In thanking Dr. Buckler for his treatment and for an invitation to go back with him to Paris, General Lee reported himself improved. I shall endeavor to be well by the fall, he wrote. His spirits were said to be fine, and he was reported to be looking better. In June, 1870, Leander J. McCormick had confirmed rumors that he contemplated the erection of a large astronomical observatory in Virginia. As he belonged to the inventor's family, long resident in the neighborhood of Lexington, the trustees had hoped that he might be prevailed upon to establish the observatory in connection with Washington College. A committee had been named at that time to correspond with Mr. McCormick on the subject. Soon after General Lee returned from his trip to Baltimore and Alexandria, the project was thought to be near a realization, and further steps to procure the observatory for the school were considered necessary. General Lee accordingly asked for a special meeting of the trustees on August 6, at which time the committee was instructed to inquire of McCormick on what terms he would permit the institution to cooperate. If he would agree to put the observatory there, the trustees pledged themselves to keep it in order, to appoint a professor of astronomy, and to raise an endowment of $100,000. That offer epitomized the progress the college had made during General Lee's administration. In 1865, when he came to Lexington, talk of raising $100,000 for the endowment of a single new department would have seemed madness. Now the trustees spoke of it confidently. General Lee was named chairman of the committee to report the board's action to the philanthropist. Subsequently, Mr. McCormick came to Lexington and, in conference with members of the faculty and of the board, reasserted his purpose to finance the observatory. He said he was not committed to any location but was determined to have it under the control of some Virginia college of established position. A movement forthwith was launched in Lexington to support the trustees' plan and to raise funds. On October 1, after General Lee had been stricken, the trustees in special meeting had renewed their previous offer and guaranteed an appropriation of $6,000 a year, pledging $100,000 of the endowment to that purpose. Had General Lee lived, it is quite probable that the observatory, which was ultimately placed at the University of Virginia, would have been erected at Lexington. General Lee's doctors were determined that his duties should not exhaust him, so, on August 9, about two weeks after his return home from Northern Virginia, they packed him off to the hot springs. He started alone with Captain White and determined to go as far as he could by railway, but after he had taken the train at Goshen the pleasures of the mountain allured him. The two companions quit the railroad and rode to the Bath Alum Springs, where they spent the night. We were in luck, he announced to Mrs. Lee, in finding several schools or parts of them rusticating on alum water. They presented a gay and happy appearance. Early the next morning, he and Professor White went on to the warm springs. There they had breakfast and met a number of the general's friends, small company but select, as he described it. From the warm it was but a short ride to the hot springs, which they reached at 9.30. Lee forthwith, as in duty bound, consulted the resident physician, who prescribed thermal treatment and predicted that, if the patient stayed long enough, the results would be good. I hope I may be benefited, Lee wrote, but it is a tedious prospect. In the letter reporting this to Mrs. Lee, there is discernible a temporary change in Lee's epistolary style. Its smoothness was lost. His sentences became short and abrupt, as if they had been spoken aloud by a man who found it difficult to catch his breath. A week of this, and then, as he grew better, he returned to his usual manner of writing. The general held faithfully to the spouts and broilers that were supposed to benefit rheumatism, but he did not enjoy them. Society has a rather solemn appearance, he told Mrs. Lee, and conversation runs mostly on personal ailments, baths and damp weather. I am having a merry time with my old cronies, tell Mildred. I am getting too heavy for them now. They soon drop me. And again, it is very wearying at these public places and the benefit hardly worth the cost. I do not think I can even stand Lexington long. A Mr. and Mrs. Leeds, from New Orleans, have arrived, with ten children, mostly little girls.
the latter are a great addition to my comfort. The general felt somewhat improved as his stay was prolonged, but on August 29th he left the springs for Staunton to attend a meeting of the stockholders of the Valley Railroad. The project for the construction of this line was now slowly taking shape. Although Baltimore had subscribed nothing, the town of Staunton had bought 1,000 shares, Bodotort County had subscribed for 2,000, and Rockbridge County had taken up 4,000. The general feeling was that the rest of the money could be raised for the road, and that if the enterprise got the support of individuals of means in the territory it was to serve, construction could be commenced. Colonel M. G. Harmon, the president of the company, had done much, but when the stockholders met in Staunton on the morning of August 30th he announced that he could not stand for re-election and that he desired General Lee be named his successor. Lee's name, influence, and management, in the opinion of Colonel Harmon, were precisely what was needed to carry the railroad into the realm of reality. Lee, of course, had no wish to take on new burdens and, from his knowledge of the poverty of the people, he had no great faith in the enterprise. It seems to me, he wrote Cyrus H. McCormick, that I have already led enough forlorn hopes. At another time he would have reasoned that it was not prudent for a struggling railroad to have a president whose death might come any day. When, however, old friends and associates insisted that he and he alone could make a success of a carrier that would serve the valley, help the town of Lexington, and benefit the college, he accepted the post. His salary, which had been fixed and may not even have been mentioned until after he consented to take the place, was put at $5,000 a year. This money was hardly a consideration, for it is said, though on vague authority, that he declined, the same summer, a business offer of $50,000 per annum. Upon the conclusion of the stockholders' meeting, General Lee returned to Lexington. It was his last journey. The session was scheduled to be opened shortly, and many preliminaries had to be arranged. On September 5 the faculty met and discussed, among other things, the means of procuring a better representation of students at chapel, a subject that had concerned the trustees. Professors were of opinion that if a clock and a bell were put in the chapel tower to give the boys notice of the hour, more of them might come. Installation of an organ, the staff also decided, would help. The faculty met again on the 10th, and still again on the 13th, for preliminary conferences. On the same days the trustees assembled for a variety of miscellaneous business, a discussion of chapel attendance, debate on whether Professor Campbell should be permitted to act as county superintendent of schools, and consideration of the act of Judge Brockenborough in resigning as trustee and rector because he had become a regular professor of law in the college. All these meetings required General Lee's direct attendance, or his accessibility in case the trustees wished to consult him. Despite the strain, he began to feel stronger and soon accounted himself definitely better. The members of the faculty were much encouraged by the evidences of his zeal and energy. On Thursday, September 15, came the formal opening of the college session. The entire student body gathered in the chapel where General Pendleton conducted the usual brief worship. The president was there, of course, and had much in mind the deliberations of trustees and of faculty on the attendance of students on the morning services, so, when the acting chaplain had finished, the general arose, made a number of announcements regarding the organization of the classes, and then expressed his earnest hope that both professors and students would attend regularly the daily prayers at the chapel. It was a short appeal but was remarked as perhaps the longest speech the general had ever made at the college. Chapter 27, Strike the Tent Three days after the opening of the session of 1870-1871, unobserved by formal ceremonies and perhaps unnoticed, the fifth anniversary of General's arrival in Lexington occurred. He had changed greatly in appearance since that September afternoon of 1865 when he had drawn rein on Traveller in front of the hotel. His hair was entirely white now and his gait was slow. Once the most erect of men, he was beginning to stoop in the shoulders. The nervous strain of the war and the difficult exercise of a stern self-control during Reconstruction had proved too much for even his stout system. Although he was only 63, he was an old man. Yet none of the work he had done since the summer of 1865 had the shadow of senescence about it. On the contrary, nothing more surely exhibits the strength of his intellect than the sustained quality of his labors and the continued sureness of his judgment during years when a similar physical condition would have been accompanied, in the case of most men, by a progressive mental decline.
He had taken a feeble, old-fashioned college and had made it a vigorous pioneer in education, the admiration of the South. Although that had demanded hourly thought and many months of grinding labor, it had not been his chief contribution to his country since the close of the war. His example had been more important than his administration. He had meant less to education than to reconciliation. Denounced and lied about, in a time more difficult than any America had ever known except in the most baffling period of the Revolution, he had preached this gospel of silence and goodwill, of patience and hard work. If the result of the war is to be considered as having decided that the union of the states is inviolable and perpetual under the Constitution, it is as incompetent for the general government to impair its integrity by the exclusion of a state as for the states to do so by secession, the existence and rights of a state by the Constitution are as indestructible as the Union itself. The legitimate consequence then must be the perfect equality of rights of all the states. The war being over, and the questions at issue, having been decided, I believe it to be the duty of everyone to unite in the restoration of the country and the re-establishment of peace and harmony. I think it wisest not to keep open the sores of war, but to follow the example of those nations who endeavored to obliterate the marks of civil strife and to commit to oblivion the feelings it engendered. All should unite in honest efforts to obliterate the effects of the war and to restore the blessing of peace. They should remain, if possible, in the country, promote harmony and good feeling, qualify themselves to vote, and elect to the state and general legislatures wise and patriotic men who will devote their abilities to the interests of the country and the healing of all dissensions. The dominant party cannot reign forever, and truth and justice will at last prevail. It should be the object of all to avoid controversy, to allay passion, and give full scope to reason and every kindly feeling. By doing this and encouraging our citizens to engage in the duties of life with all their heart and mind, with a determination not to be turned aside by thoughts of the past and fears of the future, our country will not only be restored in material prosperity, but will be advanced in science, in virtue and in religion. You can work for Virginia, to build her up again, to make her great again. You can teach your children to love and cherish her. I look forward to better days, and trust that time and experience, the great teachers of men, under the guidance of an ever-merciful God, may save us from destruction and restore to us the bright hopes and prospects of the past. We failed, but in the good providence of God, apparent failure often proves a blessing. My experience of men has neither disposed me to think worse of them nor indisposed me to serve them, nor, in spite of failures which I lament, of errors which I now see and acknowledge, or of the present aspect of affairs, do I despair of the future. The truth is this, the march of providence is so slow and our desires so impatient, the work of progress is so immense and our means of aiding it so feeble, the life of humanity is so long, that of the individual so brief, that we often see only the ebb of the advancing wave and are thus discouraged. It is history that teaches us to hope. This was the counsel of a man who not only was capable of accurate observation and precise reason, but who also was absolute master of his own soul. Had he left Virginia in 1865, many of the best men of the South might have emigrated with him, and those who remained might have been under the domination of Negroes and carpetbaggers for a generation. The South might have become an American Poland. Instead, to repeat, the Confederates came to consider it as much the course of patriotism to emulate General Lee in peace as it had been to follow him in war. More than any other American, General Lee kept the tragedy of the war from being a continuing national calamity. He did not survive to behold the industrialism he foresaw for a South rid forever of the burden of slavery, but he lived to witness the readmission of the last of the former Confederate states to the Union, despite a thousand obstacles. From five such years of passion as 18651870, what more could any man have hoped? Who would not have been willing, when that was consummated, to say nunc dimittis? Like a soldier in action, General Lee regarded his taking off as probable at any time, but he had no special premonitions and he made no deliberate preparations for the great adventure. He worked on from September 18 to September 27 in accordance with a precise and supply schedule. He saw students between 8.45 and 10.30 a.m. Then, until dinner, which came after two o'clock, he attended to the routine of the college. Then he had a brief nap, and, later, if the weather was fair, he took a short ride on Traveller over the hills around Lexington, in the strange companionship that had existed for eight years between Master and Mount.
Returning home, the general spent his evenings quietly there. He read, during his last days, of the Franco-Prussian War, and all his sympathies in that contest were with the French. No, he wrote a kinswoman, not long before Sedan, I am not glad that the Prussians are succeeding. They are prompted by ambition and a thirst for power. The French are defending their homes and country. In that he saw the struggle of his own Southland. On September 27, he attended faculty meeting as usual. The attendance was thin, and the business was of no great importance, three students wished indulgence in the payment of their tuition fees, and one wanted to withdraw on account of ill health, a committee reported the names of ministerial students who should be admitted without charge, rules were presented to govern the award of literary medals offered by Joseph Santini of New Orleans. The teachers who were seeking to stimulate attendance on chapel services were directed to consider the purchase of him books. That was all. In the minutes of this meeting, the last that General Lee ever attended, his name does not appear. The only reference to him was in the line, present the president and professors. The next morning, September 28, the general rose early and had morning prayers. If, as usual, he read the Psalter for the day, these were the words of Holy Writ with which the morning lesson ended. Praise the Lord, ye house of Israel, praise the Lord, ye house of Aaron. Praise the Lord, ye house of Levi, ye that fear the Lord, praise the Lord. Praise be the Lord out of Shaun, who dwellest at Jerusalem. And if he read on through the Psalter for the evening, he closed the book on these lines. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, yet shalt thou refresh me, thou shalt stretch forth thy hand upon the furiousness of mine enemies, and thy right hand shall save me. The Lord shall make good his loving kindness toward me, yea, thy mercy, O Lord, endureth for ever, despise not then the work of thine own hands. Eight years before, on that very date, having concluded the Sharpsburg campaign, he had written President Davis from his camp on Washington River, history records, but few examples of a greater amount of labor and fighting than have been done by this army during the present campaign. Six years before, on September 28, 1862, Ord had been preparing his surprise attack on Fort Harrison. Now, on a cloudy, chilly day, Lee had nothing on his calendar other than the routine of his office and a meeting of the Vestry of Grace Church in the afternoon. The first part of the schedule was rather heavy, for students were still being adjusted to their classes, but he found time, before dinner, to answer a letter he received that morning from Samuel H. Taggart, who, during July, had been his host in Baltimore. Mr. Taggart had written that he wanted to inveigle him into a correspondence. Lee responded cheerfully. I am much better, he said in answer to a question from Taggart. I do not know whether it is owing to having seen you and Dr. Buckler last summer or to my visit to the hot springs. Perhaps both. But my pains are less and my strength greater. In fact, I suppose I am as well as I shall be. I am still following Dr. B.S. directions and in time I may improve still more. He concluded, as usual, with friendly messages, tell, his brother is well and handsome, and I hope that he will study, or his sweethearts in Baltimore will not pine for him long. Captain, is well and busy, and joins in my remembrances. He finished and sealed this letter, completed his morning's work, and was just stepping out from his office when he met Percy Davidson, a sophomore from Lexington, who had with him a small picture of Lee, which a girl had asked him to get the general to autograph. Davidson explained this and added that as Lee was leaving, he would come some other time. No, said Lee, I will go right back and do it now. He returned and signed his name for the last time. Then he went out again and shut the door behind him to open it no more in life. From the office he walked slowly home, ate his dinner, and slept for a short time in his armchair. It was chilly after dinner and rain began to fall steadily. Lee should have stayed home to protect himself against a cold, but he did not feel he should miss the vestry meeting, which was to consider the perennial question of a new church building and was also to decide what could be done to increase the scanty salary of General Pendleton. Lee insisted on going and took no precaution against the weather other than to put on his old military cape. He walked through the rain and went directly to the church auditorium. There was no heat in the building and no smaller room into which the vestrymen could conveniently retire. They had to sit in the pews, cold and damp. 
Chatting a few minutes with his associates, the general gave an historical turn to his conversation and related several anecdotes of Chief Justice Marshall and of his old friend Bishop Mead. Then, at four o'clock, he called the meeting to order. The discussion was close and tedious. Sitting with his cape about him, Lee presided, but, as usual, did not attempt to influence the deliberations. When all who would do so had expressed their views, Lee gave his own opinion, as was his wont, briefly and without argument. After they had decided what should be done about the church building, the vestrymen began to subscribe a fund to raise Dr. Pendleton's salary. Lee was tired by this time, and despite the chill of the place, his face was flushed, but he waited in patience. All the vestrymen contributed, the clerk cast the total and announced how much was still needed to reach the desired sum. It was $55, considerably more than the part of one who already had contributed generously, but Lee said quietly, I will give that sum. Seven o'clock had struck, the hour at which, in so many of his battles, darkness had put an end to the fighting. The end had come now, not on a field of blood, but in the half-gloom of a bare little church, where the talk was of a larger house of prayer, and the only reminders of the days of strife were the cape and the weary, lined face of the old leader, and the military titles by which some of the vestrymen addressed one another. High command, great fame, heart anguish, galling burdens had ended in this last service, to plan a little church in a mountain town, and to give of his substance to raise the pay of a parson who had been his loyal lieutenant in arms. Bidding his associates good night, Lee walked home alone through the darkness and the rain, such a rain as had fallen that night when the army had crossed the Potomac on the retreat from Gettysburg. He climbed the steps. He entered the lighted house and turned into his chamber, as was his custom, to take off his damp covering and hat. Then he went to the dining room, where Mrs. Lee was waiting for him. She saw something unusual in his face and told him he looked chilly. Thank you, he said in his normal voice, I am warmly clothed. It was rare that he, the promptest of men, should delay a meal half an hour, and as he often teased wife and daughters about their tardiness, Mrs. Lee from her rolling chair smilingly challenged him, you have kept us waiting a long time, where have you been? He made no reply. Taking his usual position in front of his chair, he opened his lips to say grace. But the familiar words would not come. Another instant and he sank back to his seat. Let me pour you out a cup of tea, said Mrs. Lee, you look so tired. He tried to answer but could make no intelligible sound. On the instant he must have realized that his summons had come, for a look of resignation lighted his eyes. Then he carefully and deliberately straightened up in his chair. If it was the last enemy he had to meet now, he would face him mindfully and erect, as if he were going in to battle a stride traveler of the tossing neck. Seeing that he was seriously ill, the family sent immediately for his physicians, Dr. H. T. Barton and Dr. R. L. Madison. Both of them had been at the vestry meeting with the general, and as they lived farther from the church than Lee did, neither had reached home when the messenger arrived, but in a short time they hurried into the room. The general was placed on the couch that had been over by the windows. His outer garments were removed. You hurt my arm, he said, and pointed to the shoulder that had long been paining him. The physician's examination showed no paralysis. He was very weak, had a tendency to doze, and was slightly impaired in consciousness. The doctors decided that he had what they termed venous congestion, an impairment of the circulation that now would probably be termed a thrombosis. A bed was at once brought down from the second floor and was set up for him. Placed upon it, he turned over and went into a long and tranquil sleep from which his physicians hoped he would awake much improved. Their hopes were not altogether in vain. He was better the next day, though still very drowsy, but manifestly required careful nursing and close watching. As the rain continued to pour down and the house became damp, a fire was lighted on the hearth. The dining room table was removed and the room was turned into a sick chamber. Friends and members of the faculty began a regular round of waiting at his side. He lay quietly, now awake, now asleep, always on the borderline of the unconscious. Ere long, he responded to the treatment the doctors prescribed, and physically he seemed to improve. Taking his medicine regularly and eating with some appetite, he soon was able to turn over in bed and could sit up to swallow. The attendant's questions he understood and would answer.
His replies were monosyllables, but his family explained that he always was silent in sickness. Word spread, of course, that he was ill. The trustees had been called for September 29th, the day after the general was stricken, and with their usual consideration for him, they named a committee to express the board's regret at his absence and to consider the advisability of urging him to take a six months rest. Newspapers were quick to make inquiries and were able on September 30th to report him much improved. Despite this, reports persisted that he was paralyzed and speechless. In England, Disraeli's standard was so certain his malady was fatal that a review of his career was made ready for publication. In Lexington, apprehension battled with hope. The doctors remained confident, and Mrs. Lee talked of the time when Robert gets well, but in her heart she was haunted by the look that had come into his eyes when he had tried vainly to answer her at the supper table and then had sat upright. I saw he had taken leave of earth, she afterwards wrote. The superstitious whispered that his end was at hand because his picture had fallen down from the wall of his house, and when a flashing aurora lighted the sky for several nights some saw in it a beckoning hand. One Lexington woman tipped down a copy of the lays of the Scottish Cavaliers and pointed significantly to this quatrain. All night long the northern streamers shot across the trembling sky. Fearful lights that never beckon, save when kings or heroes die. A week passed, and General Lee's improvement, though slight, was apparent and seemed to be progressive. On October 8 a Richmond paper quoted he physicians as saying he would soon be out again. He still talked very little, and once, when Agnes started to give him his medicine, he said, it is no use. But she prevailed on him to take it. Conscious of nearly all that went on around him, he was manifestly glad to have the members of the family come in to see him. He did not smile during his whole illness, but he always met greetings of his wife and children with the pressure of his hand. On the morning of October 10, Dr. Madison thought his patient was mending. How do you feel today, General? he inquired. I feel better, said Lee, slowly but distinctly. You must make haste and get well, Traveler has been standing so long in the stable that he needs exercise. The general shook his head deliberately and closed his eyes again. It had been much the same when Custis Lee had spoken of his recovery. Lee had then moved his head from side to side and had pointed upward. That afternoon, without warning, his pulse began to flutter. His breathing became hurried. Exhaustion was apparent. The evening brought no improvement. At midnight, he had a chill, and his condition was so serious that Dr. Barton had to warn the family. One of his professors, son of his old comrade, Sidney Johnston, sat by him that night, fully appreciative of the life that was ending. Never, he recorded, was more beautifully displayed how a long and severe education of mind and character enables the soul to pass with equal step through the supreme ordeal, never did the habits and qualities of a lifetime, solemnly gathered into a few last sad hours, more grandly maintain themselves amid the gloom and shadow of approaching death. The reticence, the self-contained composure, the obedience to proper authority, the magnanimity and Christian meekness that marked all his actions, preserved their sway, in spite of the inroads of disease and the creeping lethargy that weighed down his faculties. As the old hero lay in the darkened room, or with the lamp and hearth fire casting shadows upon his calm, noble front, all the mass of grandeur of his form, and face, and brow remained, and death seemed to lose its terrors, and to borrow a grace and dignity in sublime keeping with the life that was ebbing away. The great mind sank to its last repose, almost with the equal poise of health. Lee refused medicine and nourishment the next day, even from his daughters, but despite the confusion of his mind, self-discipline still ruled, and when either of his doctors put physic to his mouth he would swallow it. During the morning he lapsed into a half-delirium of dreams and memories. His mind wandered to those dreadful battlefields. He muttered unintelligible words, prayers, perhaps, or orders to his men. Sometimes his voice was distinct. Tell Hill he must come up, he said, so plainly and emphatically that all who sat in the death chamber understood him. His symptoms now were aggravated. Mrs. Lee, in her rolling chair, took her place by his bed for the last vigil and held his moist hand. His pulse continued weak and feeble, his breathing was worse. By the end of the day the physicians admitted that the fight was lost, the general was dying.
They could only wait, not daring to hope, as he lay there motionless, save for the rapid rise and fall of his chest. His eyes were closed. When he talked in his delirium, he did not thresh about. The words, though now mingled past unraveling, were quietly spoken. At last, on October 12th, daylight came. The watchers stirred and stretched themselves and made ready to give place to those who had obtained a little sleep. Out of the windows, across the campus, the students began to move about, and after a while they struggled down to the chapel to pray for him. Now it was nine o'clock and a quarter past. His old opponent, Grant, was sitting down comfortably to breakfast in the White House. With axe or sour plow or pen, the veterans of Lee's army were in the swing of another day's work. For him it was ended, the life of discipline, of sorrow, and of service. The clock was striking his last half-hour. In some corner of his mind, not wrecked by his malady, he must have heard his marching order. Was the enemy ahead? Had that bayonet host of his been called up once again to march through Thoroughfare Gap or around Hooker's flank or over the Potomac into Maryland, moving, moving forward? Or was it that the war was over and that peace had come? Strike the tent, he said, and spoke no more. Chapter 28 The Pattern of a Life There he lies, now that they have shrouded him, with his massive features so white against the lining of the casket that he seems already a marble statue for the veneration of the South. His cause died at Appomattox, now, in him, it is to have its apotheosis. Others survive who shared his battles and his vigils, but none who so completely embodies the glamour, the genius, and the graces with which the South had idealized a hideous war. His passing sets a period to the bloodiest chapter in the history of his country. Yet even in the hour of his death there are omens that the future of the South is to be built not less on hope than on memory. The windows of the chamber do not look to the west, but to the sunrise. He is not clad in the uniform of his army but in the wedding garment he bought when he went, all unwillingly, to the marriage feast in Petersburg and found the city of his last defense breathing with new life. Presently, the bells that are tolling his death will bring down from the highlands, like the clans at the sound of the pibroch, a host of those who had followed his standard. For the moment, the first mourners are the students of the college, younger brothers of his veterans, and the children of the schools of the town, abruptly dismissed from their classes when the first note from the church belfry announced his last battle ended. Tomorrow a slow-footed procession will form to carry his body to the chapel of the college, and the press of the country will be praising his feats as a soldier and his high intellect as a leader, or else, once more, will be branding him a traitor. We who have followed his career through many pages have already discussed these things. Let us speak of them no more, but, ere the silent undertaker screws down the lid of the coffin, let us look at him for the last time and read, from his countenance, the pattern of his life. Because he was calm when others were frenzied, loving when they hated, and silent when they spoke with bitter tongue, they shook their heads and said he was a superman or a mysterious man. Beneath that untroubled exterior, they said, deep storms must rage, his dignity, his reserve, and his few words concealed somber thoughts, repressed ambitions, livid resentments. They were mistaken. Robert Lee was one of the small company of great men in whom there is no inconsistency to be explained, no enigma to be solved. What he seemed, he was, a wholly human gentleman, the essential elements of whose positive character were two and only two, simplicity and spirituality. When the nascent science of genetics is developed, Lee will be cited in the casebooks along with those who appear in Galton's hereditary genius. For his most conspicuous qualities, it may be repeated, were derived in almost equal determinable proportions from his parents and from his grandparents. From his grandfather Lee came a sense of system, the power of critical analysis that kept him free of illusion, and, along with these, perhaps, his love of animals. His good looks were an endowment from his maternal grandmother, the lowland beauty at the sight of whom the grave eyes of George Washington are said to have lighted up. To his grandfather Carter, Robert E. Lee owed much of the religion in his nature, something of the kindness, his love of family life and his devotion to his kin. Light horse Harry Lee passed on to his youngest son his fine physique, his aptitude for military affairs, his great intelligence, his daring, his sense of public duty, and the charm of manner that made him so readily a captain. The characteristics of his mother that reappear were her religion, her thrift, her self-control, her social sense, and her patience in adversity.
If it seem unscientific, at first glance, to speak with so much assurance of Lee's inherited characteristics, it may be said that the celebrity of his forebears and the diligence of the family genealogists make the facts more apparent than in most cases. Were as much known of other great American families as of the Lees, as much might be said of their descendants. Fortunate in his ancestors, Lee was fortunate most of all in that he inherited nearly all their nobler qualities and none of their worse. Genetists will say, perhaps, that this is the explanation of genius, a chance combination of genes. Beyond the frontier that these pioneers have yet crossed lies the fact that at least four generations of the ancestors of Lee, prior to that of his immediate grandparents, had all married well. Back to Richard the immigrant, whose wife's family name is unknown, there was not one instance in which a direct progenitor of Lee mated with a woman of blood and of station below his own. His line was not crossed in a century and a half with one that was degenerating. If blood means anything, he was entitled to be what he fundamentally was, a gentleman. The first reference to Lee in an extant letter is the significant statement of his father that Robert was always good and will be confirmed in his happy turn of mind by his ever watchful and affectionate mother. Does he strengthen his native tendency? Penned when the boy was ten, this language registered the impression the absent father had formed when Robert was not more than seven years of age. The stamp of character must, then, have been upon him from childhood. When he emerges dimly as a personality, in the later days of his cadetship at West Point, many of his essential qualities are apparent. Thereafter, from the time he appears clearly at Cockspur Island and at Fort Monroe, he exhibits every characteristic that later distinguished him. Subsequent change in his character was negligible and is simply the development of the man by challenging circumstance. Of this there can be no question. So consistent is the description of the young lieutenant of engineers, in the early 1830s, alike by those who became his foes and by those who remained his friends, that one need not fear the picture is touched up with the later remembrance of qualities the grizzled general displayed when he had endured the hard ordeal of the war between the states. This early development of character, like everything else that relates to Lee as an individual, is easily understood. Despite the ill health of the mother and her unhappiness during her pregnancy, he had a strong and normal nervous system that was invigorated by a simple outdoor life. Although there is no evidence that Mrs. and Lee had any secret dread that her son would develop the recklessness of his father, there is abundant proof that, with tactful wisdom, she inculcated in him from childhood the principles of self-control. From earliest adolescence he had upon him the care of his mother. George Washington, the embodiment of character, was his hero, made real and personal in the environment of Alexandria. At West Point his ambition to excel in his class led Lee to subject himself willingly and with a whole heart to a discipline that confirmed every excellence he had acquired at home. Physically more developed than most of the cadets, he had from the outset a better appreciation of what the training of the academy was designed to accomplish. All his early assignments to engineering duty were of a sort to impose responsibility. These circumstances did not destroy his sunny exuberance of spirit, but they set his character so early and so definitely that it did not change with years or woes. Whether it was at the Des Moines Rapids, or during his superintendency of West Point, or in the President's House at Washington College, wherever he was in full four decades when the burden of battle was not on him, an old acquaintance would have observed little difference in his daily outlook, his nature, or his manners. Only in four particulars was the man who went to that last vestry meeting at the Episcopal Church in Lexington unlike the lieutenant who bantered the beautiful Talcott at Old Point in the moments he was not watching the contractors who might circumvent the government. His buoyant bearing had given way to a calmer cheerfulness, which might have been the case with any man who has bridged the chasm that divides the twenties of life from the sixties, even though no river of blood had flowed through the chasm. Again, the natural dignity of his person had settled into a more formal reserve, not because he had become less simple in heart or less approachable in manner, but because his conception of his duty to promote peace and national unity compelled him to put a wall between him and those who might have stirred unhappy memories and would certainly have kept open the old wounds of fratricidal war had he permitted them to talk of war. Even then, it is quite likely that some of those who knew him after the war mistook their reverence for his reserve. He was changed, also, in that, after 1865, he put out of his heart the military career that long had fascinated him. All the misgivings he had felt before the war regarding the pursuit of arms were confirmed by five years at Lexington.
he spoke his conviction, as always, when he told young Professor Humphreys that the great mistake of his life had been in pursuing the education of a soldier, and he was not jesting in his encomium to General Ewell on the delights of a civil life. It was not by chance that he failed to keep in step with the superintendent of V.M. when the two walked together at the head of the column of cadets. These things apart, anyone who had worked with him on the wharf at St. Louis would have felt at home in his office in Lexington and would have found him the same man in the habits of life, in the study routine, and in the simplicity of spirit that were his very ego. He rose early and cheerfully and had his private devotions. If he was away from home, he would write his domestic letters before breakfast. At the meal hour he would appear promptly, with greetings to all and with gentle, bantering reproaches for his always tardy wife. Were his food the sumptuous fare of bountiful Arlington, he would enjoy and praise each dish, eating with heartiness, but when he sat down to the plain diet of the first hard days at Lexington he showed the same relish and made no complaint. Family worship over, he would go to work immediately, neatly dressed and with the whitest of linens, but never ostentatiously apparelled. In his labor, he was swift and diligent, prompt and accurate, always systematic and instinctively thrifty. His ambition was in his labor, whatever its nature. He did not covet praise. Blushing to receive it, he assumed that others would blush when he bestowed it, and he spared what he thought were their feelings, though no man was quicker to appreciate and, at the proper time, to acknowledge the achievement of others. Place and advancement never lured him, except his promotion held out the hope of larger opportunity and better provision for his family. Even then he was meticulous regarding the methods he would employ to further himself financially, and he would never capitalize his name or draw drafts on the good opinion of friends or public. Yet he had all his life the desire to excel at the task assigned him. That was the urge alike of conscience, of obligation, of his regard for detail, and of his devotion to thoroughness as the prime constituent of all labor. He never said so in plain words, but he desired everything that he did, whether it was to plan a battle or to greet a visitor, to be as nearly perfect as he could make it. No man was more critical of his own performance, because none demanded more of himself. The engineer's impulse in him was most gratified if something was to be created or organized, but if it concerned another's happiness or had a place in the large design of worthwhile things, he considered the smallest task proper to perform. Only the useless was irksome. He endured interruption of his work without vexation. Rarely was he embarrassed in his dealings with men. He met every visitor, every fellow worker, with a smile and a bow, no matter what the other's station in life. Always he seemed to keep others at a judicious distance and did not invite their confidences, but he sought as a gentleman to make every right-minded person comfortable in his presence. With a tact so delicate that others scarcely noticed it, when he was busy he kept conversation to the question at issue, and he sought to make his interviews brief, but even so, his consideration for the sensibilities of others cost him many a precious hour. Wrangles he avoided, and disagreeable persons he usually treated with a cold and freezing courtesy. Should his self-control be overborne by stupidity or ill-temper, his eyes would flash and his neck would redden. His rebuke would be swift and terse, and it might be two hours or more before he was completely master of himself. Whoever visited him meantime would perhaps find him irascible, though sure to make amends. Exacting of his subordinates, he still reconciled himself often to working with clumsy human tools. Resentments he never cherished. When he found men unworthy of his confidence, he made it his practice to see them as little as possible and to talk to them not at all. Silence was one of his strongest weapons. During the war he summarized his code when he wrote these words on a scrap of paper that nobody saw until after his death. The forbearing use of power does not only form a touchstone, but the manner in which an individual enjoys certain advantages over others is a test of a true gentleman. The power which the strong have over the weak, the employer over the employed, the educated over the unlettered, the experienced over the confiding, even the clever over the silly, the forbearing or inoffensive use of all this power or authority, or a total abstinence from it when the case admits it, will show the gentleman in a plain light. The gentleman does not needlessly and unnecessarily remind an offender of a wrong he may have committed against him. He can not only forgive, he can forget, and he strives for that nobleness of self and mildness of character which imparts sufficient strength to let the past be but the past.
A true man of honor feels humbled himself when he cannot help humbling others. Lee sought to conclude his work by early afternoon, even if that compelled him to set a late hour for the meal. When dinner was done, he was glad of a brief period of relaxation and sometimes of a little sleep, usually upright in his chair. Then he sought his daily exercise in a ride on his horse. He delighted to have a companion, and if he had one, he talked of pleasant topics. Riding alone, which he often did, he would close his mind to the difficulties of the day and to the problems of the morrow and would soothe himself with the discovered beauties of the countryside. Nothing of a physical nature gave him the same thrill as a glowing sunset. Usually, on these rides, he paid his calls on the sick and on strangers, as diligently as if had been the parson of their town. This he regarded as one of his social duties, and he discharged it not only with willingness but also with satisfaction. Whether his ride included social calls or simply carried him to a given objective, he was always on the alert for children and he never passed them without a greeting, and, usually, a chat. His return home, like all his other movements, was according to a precise schedule. Unless a sudden storm detained him, he would be at his door promptly at dusk and would soon be ready for his light evening meal, tea as the family called it. The hours then belonged to Mrs. Lee, to his children, and to his guests. He would read to them or converse cheerfully until bedtime, which was usually after ten o'clock. When he retired to his own room he had his evening prayers and was soon asleep. His quarters at Lexington were always as neat as if he were still a cadet at West Point, but the only suggestion of the soldier was the army pistol that hung in its holster by the head of his bed. After Mrs. Lee's invalidism afflicted her, he rarely went out to social affairs. Before that time he sometimes attended her to parties or to dinners, where he preferred the company of women to that of men, and that of the daughters to the mothers. Always his address was dignified, but to young girls it was often bantering. Nothing delighted him more than gently to tease some blushing young beauty. He had neither high wit nor quick repartee, though occasionally he essayed a pun, but his smile, his manners, and his quick understanding made him socially irresistible. His conversation, however, never turned to forbidden topics, nor was there in it anything suggestive or of double entente. In all his letters, and there are several thousand of them, as in all his reported conversation, and there are countless anecdotes of him, no oath or vulgarism appears. He was clean-minded, though definitely and unfeignedly attracted to intelligent, handsome women. Leaves and furloughs during his army service and vacations after the war found him ready to travel, not to distant lands, but to the spas of Virginia or, better still, to the houses of congenial friends. Most of all did he relish a round of visits to his own kin, with whom he delighted to talk of the doings of their relatives. Chatter of this sort never bored him. Naturally sociable and devoted to his countless cousins, he sympathized with all their distresses and rejoiced in their little triumphs. Rarely was he too busy, when time allowed of his writing at all, to chronicle every wedding, every birth, every journey, every sickness, for the information of his family correspondents. At home, in his earlier periods of leisure, he shared in the sports of his sons, and to the end of his life he gave to each of his daughters a measure of courtly attention fitted to the temperament and age of each of them. At intervals habitual cheerfulness was marred by a sense of failure. This was most apt to overtake him when he was absent from home on long tours of military duty, for his simple nature made him dependent on his wife and children. Separated from them, he often suffered loneliness and sometimes acute nostalgia. On occasion, and particularly during the difficult period when he was struggling to settle Mr. Custis's estate and to repair Arlington in 1857-1859, this sense of frustration came upon him even at home. Then he would wonder why he did not advance more rapidly in the army and would puzzle himself to know how he could make adequate provision for his daughters, none of whom, in his heart of hearts, he wished to be married. These were the most unhappy times of his life, except perhaps those of his occasional illnesses. When sick, he would have few words even for his family, and was more than apt to lose his grip upon himself or in dealing with others. This was the pattern of his daily life. There is every reason to believe it was the mirror of his own soul. Those who look at him through the glamour of his victories or seek deep meaning in his silence will labour in vain to make him appear complicated. His language, his acts, and his personal life were simple for the unescapable reason that he was a simple gentleman.
simple and spiritual, the two qualities which constitute the man cannot be separated. The strongest religious impulse in his life was that given him by his mother. After that, in youth, he probably came most under the indirect influence of Rev. William Meade, later bishop, the clergyman who did more than anyone else to restore the Protestant Episcopal Church in Virginia from the ruin that had overtaken it during and after the American Revolution. Mr. Meade was rector in Alexandria for only 18 months and then at a time when Robert was too young to heed his sermons, but he preached there often during Robert's youth and his spirit dominated the Episcopal Church in Virginia. He was a picturesque personality, one of the prophets of his generation. Holding to the beautiful forms of his faith, Mr. Mead breathed into its worship and evangelism as ardent as that of the younger American denominations. In his eyes, religion concerned itself equally with acts and with beliefs. No reformer was ever more uncompromising in his denunciation of cards or more unyielding in opposition to the old habit the barons of the northern neck had of staging races and of backing their horses with their dollars. None excoriated the stage with warnings more sulfurious than did Mr. Mead. Had he been sent to idolatrous Israel, he could not more solemnly have proclaimed the day of the vengeance of the Lord or have portrayed more darkly the fearsome punishment visited on the sinner for his hardness of heart. Yet he spoke comfortably to Jerusalem. He gave the promise of forgiveness to the repentant, pictured glowingly to the faithful the bliss of hard-won heaven, and somehow planted in the hearts of the dominant class in that section of the old dominion a religion of simplicity, vigor, and sincerity. It is a singular fact the young Robert Lee was not prompted by the exhortations of Mr. Mead or of like-minded clergymen to submit himself to confirmation. The reason cannot be surmised, unless it was that the theology of his youth had a vehemence and an emotionalism alien to his nature. He was content until he was past forty-five to hold to the code of a gentleman rather than to the formal creed of a church. The experiences of the Mexican War, the gentle piety of the Fitzhughes at Ravensworth, the example and death of Mrs. Custis, the simple faith of Mrs. Lee, and, more immediately, the purpose of his daughters to enter into the full fellowship of the church induced Lee in 1853 to renew his vows. After that time, first his sense of dependence on God for the uprearing of his boys during his long absences from home, and then the developing tragedy of the war, deepened every religious impulse of his soul. And what did religion imply for him as he sent Pickett's men up Cemetery Ridge, as he rode to the McLean House, as he read of Military District No. 1, and as he looked down from the chapel platform at the scarred faces and patched garments of his students? To answer that question is to employ the terms of a theology that now seems to some outworn and perhaps archaic. It was, however, the credo of a man who met the supreme tests of life in that he accepted fame without vanity and defeat without repining. To understand the faith of Robert E. Lee is to fill out the picture of him as a gentleman of simple soul. For him as for his grandfather, Charles Carter, religion blended with the code of noblesse oblige to which he had been reared. Together, these two forces resolved every problem of his life into right and wrong. The clear light of conscience and of social obligation left no zone of grey in his heart, everything was black or white. There cannot be said to have been a secret of his life, but this assuredly was the great, transparent truth, and this it was, primarily, that gave to his career its consistency and decision. Over his movements as a soldier he hesitated often, but over his acts as a man, never. There was but one question ever, what was his duty as a Christian and a gentleman? That he answered by the sure criterion of right and wrong, and, having answered, acted. Everywhere the two obligations went together, he never sought to expiate as a Christian for what he had failed to do as a gentleman, or to atone as a gentleman for what he had neglected as a Christian. He could not have conceived of a Christian who was not a gentleman. Kindness was the first implication of religion in his mind, not the deliberate kindness of good works to pacify exacting deity, but the instinctive kindness of a heart that had been schooled to regard others. His was not a nature to waste time in the perplexities of self-analysis, but if those about him at headquarters had understood him better they might often have asked themselves whether, when he brought a refreshing drink to a dusty lieutenant who called with dispatches, he was discharging the social duty of a host or was giving a cup of cold water in his master's name. His manner in either case would have been precisely the same. Equally was his religion expressed in his unquestioning response to duty. In his clear creed, right was duty and must be discharged.
There is, he wrote down privately for his own guidance, a true glory and a true honor, the glory of duty done, the honor of the integrity of principle. He probably never summed up this aspect of his religion more completely than in that self-revealing hour before he started to meet General Grant, when he answered all the appeals of his lieutenants with the simple statement, the question is, is it right to surrender this army? If it is right, then I will take all the responsibility. It was a high creed, right at all times and at all costs, but daily self-discipline and a clear sense of justice made him able to adhere to it. Humility was another major implication of his religion. So lofty was his conception of man's duty to his maker and to his neighbors, so completely did his ambition extend, all unconsciously, into the realm of the spirit, that he was never satisfied with what he was. Those who stood with him on the red field of Appomattox thought that his composure was due to his belief that he had discharged his full duty, and in this they were partially correct, but he always felt, with a sincerity no man can challenge, that he had fallen immeasurably short of his ideal of a servant of God. So humble was he as a Christian, wrote Mrs. Lee on the day of his death, that he said not long ago to me he wished he felt sure of his acceptance. I said all who love and trust in the Saviour need not fear. He did not reply, but a more upright and conscientious Christian never lived. Born of this humility, this sense of unworthiness in the sight of God, was the submission to the divine will that has so often been cited in these pages to explain his calmness in hours that would have wrecked the self-control of lesser men. There was nothing of blind fatalism in his faith. Resignation is scarcely the name for it. Believing that God was infinite wisdom and eternal love, he subjected himself to seeming ill fortune in the confidence that God's will would work out for man's good. If it was a battle that had been won, to Almighty God he gave the glory, if it was a death that had brought grief to the family, he reminded his wife that their Heavenly Father knew better than they, and that there was eternal peace and sure reunion after life. Nothing of his serenity during the war or of his silent labor in defeat can be understood unless one realizes that he submitted himself in all things faithfully to the will of a divinity which, in his simple faith, was directing wisely the fate of nations and the daily life of his children. This, and not the mere physical courage that defies danger, sustained him in battle, and this, at least equally with his sense of duty done, made him accept the results of the war without even a single gesture of complaint. Of humility and submission was born a spirit of self-denial that prepared him for the hardships of the war and, still more, for the dark destitution that followed it. This self-denial was, in some sense, the spiritual counterpart of the social self-control his mother had inculcated in his boyhood days, and it grew in power throughout his life. He loved the luxury that wealth commanded. Had he been as rich as his grandfather Carter, he would have lived in a style as hospitable. Fine horses and handsome clothes and lavish entertainments would have been his, Arlington would have been adorned, and his daughters would have enjoyed travel and the richest comfort. But Arlington was confiscated, its treasures were scattered, each stage of his sacrifice for the South brought him lower and lower in fortune until he was living in a borrowed tenant house and his wife was husbanding the scraps from a pair of trousers a farmer's wife had made for him. His own misfortunes typified the fate of the Confederacy and of its adherents. Through it all, his spirit of self-denial met every demand upon it, and even after he went to Washington College and had an income on which he could live easily, he continued to deny himself as an example to his people. Had his life been epitomized in one sentence of the book he read so often, it would have been in the words, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross daily, and follow me. And if one, only one, of all the myriad incidents of his stirring life had to be selected to typify its message, as a man, to the young Americans who stood in hushed awe that rainy October morning as their parents wept at the passing of the Southern Arthur, who would hesitate in selecting that incident? It occurred in Northern Virginia, probably on his last visit there. A young mother brought her baby to him to be blessed. He took the infant in his arms and looked at it and then at her and slowly said, teach him he must deny himself. That is all. There is no mystery in the coffin there in front of the windows that look to the sunrise.